Welcome back to Physical Anthropology. Today we're looking at Chapter 11, the archaic members of the genus Homo. So these are going to be those species that came after Homo erectus, but before modern day Homo sapiens. So the first thing we're going to do is compare and contrast three different models for human distribution. Then we're going to look at specific members of the archaic Homo sapiens, including um, Homo erectus, just to compare them to Homo sapiens, as well as the Neanderthals, and then finally Homo floresiensis. We mentioned previously there was a changing environment going on at this time, and because of the change in temperatures, there's going to be changes in sea levels. This does allow a little bit more migration to occur because there's not as much separating the continents from each other. We also see, of course, changes in potentially food sources and shelter. So those are gonna put pressures on these groups of animals to migrate to wherever they can find food. So the first model for why humans ended up where they are today is something called the out of Africa theory. This explained that modern humans originated in Africa and then as they migrated out of Africa, they replaced any other type of genus Homo that existed there but that there was no gene flow between any of these groups, nor with the original ancestors in Africa. The multi-regional hypothesis says that modern Homo sapiens are directly derived from Homo erectus and actually evolved after Homo erectus left Africa. So once they left, then modern Homo sapiens would have evolved on those other continents, such as Asia and Europe. The theory that actually has the most evidence is the final theory, which is the simulation theory. It kind of combines the best of both of these original ideas. So there's evidence to show that humans did originate in Africa and migrated out, but they continued to interbreed with other archaic forms that they encountered, including um, other homo uh, examples that still lived in Africa, as well as the newer ones that were living in Asia and Europe at that time. So if you look at the graph on the right, the idea is that the modern Homo sapiens would have interbred with, for example, the Neanderthals that existed in Europe. They were also interbreeding with any other um, subspecies that they may have found in Africa as well as Asia. So that there was plenty of gene flow happening and there is DNA evidence to support this. So what makes you a member of the archaic Homo sapiens? Basically, um, some examples are that you do still live in the old world, so none of these guys ever made it to North or South America. You would have existed between 200 to 600,000 years ago, and you would be a transitional species between the Homo erectus and the modern day Homo sapiens. So there's quite a few uh, examples of them. We'll talk about Neanderthals. Um, there's also a bunch of other species you can look up in more detail. Defining a species when it's a fossil can be very tricky because of the fact that we don't always know that much about their behaviors in terms of are they interbreeding. Now that we have found some fossils where there's still DNA remnants and we're able to do DNA analysis, now we are able to get more information about interbreeding. But before when the fossil record was only uh, mineralized material with no DNA, then it's much harder to speculate on that. Some additional information about th this group is that they're going to have quite large brain sizes with at least 1,100 cubic centimeters. They're going to have uh, much larger skulls, smaller brow ridges than that of Homo erectus, and they're going to, of course, have, again, less prognathism. So just a quick comparison of Homo erectus versus these modern examples. Hopefully you remember that Homo erectus had about a 900 cubic centimeter brain size, and now we're looking at well over a thousand. And in fact, the Neanderthals have the largest of all the cranial capacity of the fossils we have found at 1500 cubic centimeters. So those guys are huge. Modern Homo sapiens actually have right around 1400 cubic centimeters on average. Uh, an interesting thing is that the forehead, okay, so the forehead is starting to emerge in these species. That means that basically the cranium is um, going to elevate above the brow ridges rather than going straight back. And that's because we're going to see the development of increase in the brain size, specifically of the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe of the brain is a very important part of the brain where we think uh, important decision-making, critical thinking skills, and higher level, higher order thinking exists in that part of the brain, while other parts of the brain have more primitive functions. So having a larger, uh, basically, forehead indicates more intelligence and more intelligent behavior. 
Now, when you look at the chin, what's interesting is that these guys do still have an absent chin, absent chin, but their jaw has been reduced. So their teeth size is getting smaller. The prognathism is being reduced. When you get to modern humans, we do have a chin, and that means that our face is now so flat and our jaw has been so reduced that the mental eminence is present. The mental eminence is basically the little bony part of your lower jaw that sticks out to make it look like a chin. The Homo erectus still had a very large brow ridge, while these guys, while they do have a brow ridge and it's going to be bigger than modern humans, it's not quite as large as that of Homo erectus. And again, we're going to have smaller teeth, like I mentioned. Um, the bones of modern humans are quite gracile, that means that they're quite thin, uh, while the archaic species would have still been a little bit more robust. That has to do with their body shape and body type, especially Neanderthals are going to be very robust because of their environment, which is that they were living during this ice age. So my first review question for you is, the model of human origins that attempts to incorporate all lines of evidence, including fossil and DNA evidence, is called which? A, out of Africa hypothesis, B, assimilation hypothesis, C, multi-regional continuity hypothesis, or D, mitochondrial Eve hypothesis. So hopefully you remember that this was called the assimilation hypothesis because it combined the two ideas of the out of Africa as well as the multi-regional. Going back to this image that we've seen before of all the different uh, hominin ancestors, we have those Australopithecines that are overlapping with the early, uh, early Homo uh, members. But now what we're going to look at is some more recent members, including the Neanderthals. Neanderthals actually only went extinct about 35,000 years ago. So they've been around uh, at the same time as modern Homo sapiens. They actually lived in the same areas of Europe. We're also going to look at an interesting, unique uh, example called Homo floresiensis because they have some unusual traits that were only recently discovered. So who were the Neanderthals? The Neanderthals, which are kind of our typical example of a caveman, we think of this like very bulky, hairy, um, human-like creature that's running around hunting animals and it's wearing furs and things like that. So what's going on with them? Basically, they lived in Europe and they are named after where their first fossils were discovered, which is in the Neander Valley. And what happened with their bodies is that they were very much adapted to the cold climate of that ice age. And they were most likely hunting those animals, the, the large animals that existed during the ice age, such as, such as mammoths and some other large mammals. They're very robust in terms of their skeleton. So if you had a side-by-side -side comparison of a Neanderthal and a Homo sapiens, uh, you would see that their bones are much thicker. And interestingly, their cranial capacity is actually larger than ours. But one thing that's different about it is that their, the way their skull is shaped, it's the back portion of the skull that's larger, which is the occipital region. That's a region that we associate with things like vision. And it's not the frontal area, which is the part I was telling you about in terms of critical thinking, uh, problem solving, abstract thinking and creativity, all of that would be in the frontal area. And those are all things that our species is excellent at. So what else is unique about them? They do still have quite a large brow ridge. They do still have some prognathism. Um, they do have a large jaw size, but they were going to be cooking their food. So that just like Homo erectus before them, there's going to be evidence of hearths and fire used to cook food. We also see uh, more advanced tool use, which I'll show you some examples of. And their bodies, again, are relatively thick and stocky with a very large barrel-shaped chest. So they're going to be using something called Mysterian tools. Mysterian tools are going to be more advanced than the tools we've seen up to this point. And they're using something called the Levallois technique, which, again, requires more preparation and more thinking ahead. And that's because the way it was created is that they would prepare the stone ahead of time and then flake the same stone multiple times to get a couple of different tools um, with very specific uses. So they're going to have different types of tools for different uses. They're also going to start combining the stone tools with wooden shafts to make spears. So this is going to be spears that are for thrusting for very close range hunting. 
Another interesting thing is that we have the first evidence of burials. So we know that animals don't bury their dead. When an animal dies, it's eaten by scavengers or predators, um, it decays, and then sometimes the bones might end up in the ground, they might fossilize. But with Neanderthals, we see bodies that were clearly buried because they were placed in very specific positions. There are grave goods next to the body. That means that they were buried with items. So these people were already starting to think about what happens after death. So this is the beginning of things like culture and religion, where we're thinking about where do people go after death? Uh, what might they need in the afterlife? And so they were buried with sometimes food items or tools or weapons that they could potentially use in the future. And this is really critical because if the Neanderthals didn't believe in any of that, they're not gonna waste putting food and tools next to a dead body because they could be using that themselves. So the fact that they were willing to sacrifice these important goods and bury them with the dead means that they definitely thought that the, the person could use it in the future. Other uh, important pieces of information is that we do have evidence of them interbreeding with modern homo sapiens. So for a long time, we weren't sure if that was happening, but DNA analysis has proven that that did occur. So why did they go extinct? They basically went extinct at the end of the ice age, as did many large mammals of that time period. So what we think happened is that they were very much adapted for that cold environment and that they weren't able to make the changes that are necessary to survive in the new warmer climate. So why did that happen? Well, there's going to, when there's an end of an ice age, there's gonna be changes obviously in the animal life. Okay, so maybe the animals that they were hunting and relying on to eat went extinct. The plant life would also be changing. There's evidence that there were some volcanic eruptions during that time period, which also affected the plant resources available. So they're just not able to find enough food. In addition to that, there's evidence that they may have had some reproductive problems. For example, they actually uh, matured at a later time in their life than modern humans do, which means they're going to be less successful in terms of reproduction, in terms of having uh, a certain number of children before they die. And there's probably decreased fertility in that group. Another important aspect is that their habitat did overlap with modern day Homo sapiens. And so we probably competed for some of the same resources, uh, food and shelter. And because of the changes in our brain and the differences in our brain, it's possible that modern Homo sapiens were simply better at adapting to the new changes and the Neanderthals simply couldn't adapt fast enough. So we outcompeted them. And as I mentioned, there is evidence of some interbreeding. So if there were only a few Neanderthals left and they weren't able to find enough of their own kind, they may have been mating with modern day Homo sapiens. And so what we actually have are the hybrid hybrid descendants of the two of them. The last example I want to give you is a, a very unique fossil we found um, on the island of Flores in Indonesia. We've previously mentioned that when animals move to an island, they often undergo rapid evolution because there's different pressures on the island than there were on the main continent. So we saw that with the Galapagos finches. And what's happening with uh, this particular group of people is that they are super small. So the members of this species on this island have very small body size. They were only about one meter tall. And that just kind of threw out a lot of the ideas that people had of human evolution because up to this point, what we've actually seen is an increase in human body size, increase in cranial capacity, increase in tool use and things like that but these little guys are much smaller. And we do see this with other types of animals as well, that when they move on to an island and there's no predators, they're going to start changing their behaviors, they're gonna change their genetics. And maybe the small size was beneficial because there weren't that many resources on the island. So being small would allow you to survive better. And that wraps it up for chapter 11.